Hello, my name's Joey and uh, I'm here with Stuart Girling and we're going to be taking a look at um, Koromasana and Sukta Koromasana and because I've been asked about uh, this pose, the way I tend to think about it is I take it back a little bit to think about the, the primary action. So I'm going to take it back to Bhujapidasana and actually briefly when we start the Bhujapidasana variation we're also going to be taking a little glance at Marichasana 1. So um, I'm just going to demonstrate for you uh, the classic entry to Bhujapidasana and then we'll start from there. So if I show you... So in that uh, demonstration, in that kind of classic method, we jump around and hook the feet. Um, and to do that jump requires um, obviously some strength and some uh, control. But the main thing is it actually requires mobility in the, the hips and the groin. So when I'm introducing this uh, to people, the first thing I ask them to do is come to a squatting position like so. Okay, doesn't matter too much if the heels are lifted, although that is a telltale sign often that there's some uh, stiffness there. And now the next thing, and this is the bit that's really important, is where is the sides of the rib cage in relation to the inner thigh? So if I just turn slightly to the profile, often you'll see people are stuck, something like this. Okay, this is common, or this is common. Um, now, what you'll see I'm doing to, uh, to, to, to gain the momentum or to, be, to gain the motion for me to position the hand in the correct way is I can actually just lean forward and drop into this position here, you see? Now, we're not going to look at it in too much detail, but if you can imagine one leg straight, that's the same motion that's actually occurring in Marichalsana 1. So in Marichalsana 1, that's where we start the motion, but really what we have to do is squat and this reminds me, and I often share this story with students, is when I first went to Nepal, I was 18 years old, and down in Kathmandu at the bus stand, you'd drink chai waiting for the bus around a fire. It was winter time when I was there, and everybody just squatted like this. Culturally, you know, they don't sit on the floor because the bottoms would get cold, uh, and there's no chairs and no furniture around. So actually, when you're drinking a cup of tea like this, if you're like me, you'll often experience there's some stiffness in the ankles or some stiffness in the groin. So what I'd ask people to do always is get comfortable squatting and preferably spend as long as five, ten minutes here, okay? The way I challenged myself in this back in the day when I was learning is having got back from Kathmandu to London where I was living, I would wait at the bus, okay? So I'd wait at the bus stop and I'd hope the bus was only going to take three minutes, okay? But sometimes it was 20. And this was back in London before it had the little display of you have 15 minutes to go, which probably made it easier. So, you know, that's what I did, okay? Now, in terms of what, uh, what you need to be doing to work on here is you can take the elbows, press into the thighs, go a little bit wider. And the other motion, this is really important because normally you get to a point where you don't seem to be able to go any further, is you just now lift the bottom up a little bit, now lean forward, okay, and then drop down. Can you just push this camera this way? I'll just show you one other method to do that. So if I happen to be holding onto a post or perhaps the banisters, often I'll ask people to hold here lift a little bit, pull slightly forward here so you can see the chest is coming further forward and then drop down, okay? When I'm doing that, at the moment my knees are going very wide, so if I turn this way you can see as I'm going forward the knees are going very wide, but later having gone quite far forward you now need to add this action of squeezing the inner thighs in, okay? So you squeeze the knees in, okay? But in the beginning don't worry about that action, just let it go wide, drop forward, keep lifting the pelvis up, leaning forward a bit, then dropping down. As I drop down deeper there, I start to feel more movement in the groin. That's the most important bit to make the pose accessible, okay? We scan that this way. If it's not accessible, okay? So if we're trying to get the hand here, the hand won't go flat. If the back of the knee is not coming up high around the deltoid or the top of the arm, it's just not really possible to lift up. So this is when you'll often see if I imitate a stiff person trying to do it. This is you sort of see this kind of thing happening and it just doesn't really seem to work, okay? Simply because they haven't got the motion in the groin here, okay? 
Um, there's probably other parts of the body that are, you know, into the equation of tightness. So the squatting element's vital, okay? Now, the next element, okay, are actually hooking here. Most people who've got this mobility, they start here. The first thing they do when the feet cross is they hook the ankles in this way, okay? So you can see from here to here, they hook the ankles. When you hook the ankles, again, if I show you from straight on, this tends to happen, okay? So I squeeze the knees in, okay? As soon as I hook the ankles, watch my knees, you see they start to go wider, okay? What's happening then is you're relying on the ankles to keep everything together and you're relaxing the inner thighs. What we have to learn is that the adductors, these muscles of the inner thighs, have to clamp on here. It's this action, okay? Which is kind of probably not used in everyday life all that much, okay? So because of that, I'm going to take a brief little look at Ekapada Bhujapidasana. Here, for those of you that regularly practice intermediate series, you'll know it because we jump in and we hover there for a moment before coming down, taking the leg behind the head. You don't need to be that mobile though. What we do is this, we take the foot towards the head or possibly we take the foot to the ear. We play around with this kind of motion here in order to mobilize the, from the groin and the hip this way, okay? Now, I bring my hand through and I jut the elbow out to the side, okay? Now I lean forward, so I'm lining up the hands with the middle of the straight leg thigh. Okay, now from here, I take my chest down towards the thigh, and now I grip at the abdomen. Okay, so when I lift, I don't just lift the chest up, I bring the left thigh with me, so the straight leg's coming up. Okay, and I hold that there. Now, again, if I show you that from here, what will often happen when I'm asking people to do this, is slowly I start to see that sliding out of this leg. Okay, so you've got to learn that clamping action. If I just show you on the other side, I play around a little bit here, taking the thigh back. If you watch, from this way, as the thigh goes back there, that's the same as when the chest was going forward. Same movement, basically coming from Mary Chelsea and one. Okay. Now from here, again, I lean forward, lift up. Okay. And you just hold that there. Okay. When you get used to holding that there, you learn this action that seems to link from the inner thigh to the abdomen. Okay. That squeezing action is what draws you up, and that's really what we need to rely on in the, uh, the Bhujapidasana. So if you see, what I'd ask many people to do once they've got this initial uh, work of Bhujapidasana is instead of hooking the feet, point, take the feet even closer together. And then now as I go down, I'm actually lifting my heels up. Okay, the heels have to go up. If you think about it, when the heel is going up, okay, the heel is actually coming closer to the buttock. So we've got two main actions in Bhujapidasana. The first action I've described, inner thigh clamps on, okay, squeezes in. That's using this uh, muscles of the adductors. And then when the heel is coming towards the buttock there, we're contracting the hamstring. So the back of the thigh has to contract. And that's mostly what I find people kind of have a little moment when I inform them, they go, aha, oh, we haven't realized that. We're so used to stretching the hamstrings and the forward bends up until this point. Now, when we learn to actually squeeze the heel in and contract the hamstring, that's normally something that we haven't really thought through. Okay, so two actions there and there, okay? Um, one final point in Bhujapidasana, uh, which doesn't relate hugely to Kormasana, but we look at it anyway, is if you look at me from profile, when I get to this part of going down, Okay, I actually have to take the whole body back. Okay, so I'm literally sliding everything back, 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 back there. And the other little motion that I often tend to ask people to think about is the movement is not dissimilar from moving from here down into Chaturanga. Okay, and back up. If you look at what goes on here in the shoulder girdle, it's basically that motion of going down and up. Okay, as you go down, pelvis feet go back and through and up in this squeezing action. Okay. Now, that's vital because knowing how to work the legs in that way is remarkably similar to Kuramasana, okay? So if I just briefly demonstrate uh, Kuramasana, what I tend to do is jump forward, same entry, okay? And now from here, start to straighten the legs. So this is basically Titibasana. And I'm actually taking the, uh, the feet and the buttocks to the same height, parallel to the floor, and then keeping everything fairly straight, I start to lower down. Now at this last minute, I bend the knees a little bit, deliberately, okay? And I check that my feet are not too wide, so they're about the width of a mat there. This mat's fairly wide, okay? The arms go back, so not straight out to the side there, but back. It's like two Vs, okay? So the legs are a forward V, the arms are the V going backwards. Now slowly, okay, I work on squeezing the inner thighs and the knees onto the sides of the ribcage. 
that makes my bat round more okay if you watch if there's no action in the leg there you start to see everything coming through as i squeeze my knees in now the bat starts to round much more so here we now work on straightening by uh, sorry pointing pointing the feet and then on the next exhalation flex so for me for a long time the legs wouldn't straighten so i would work on this action it's not a classical instruction but it's exhale Inhale, weight, exhale, flex, inhale, point, exhale, flex, inhale, point, exhale, flex, okay? When we work here, there's a tendency, because people are so keen to straighten the legs too soon, for the legs to go too wide, okay? And many people, they actually think of Upavishtukanasana with the hands going underneath. What I always urge people is to, to try and sever that connection in the mind. It's a totally different pose. If you look at the spine here, it's generally considered to be you know, straighter in this pose, whereas if you look at the spine again here, it's much more, you know, like it's describing in the metaphor of the turtle, it's much more rounded. So here what I feel like is it feels as if the, uh, the spinal muscles here are uh, broadening across the back. There's much more sense of uh, broadening, widening, as opposed to just lengthening, okay? So in my, in my mind, the directionality of the back is going much more like this, particularly with the breath spreading out to the sides, okay? Um, so that's the, the Kuramasana action. Now the second thing that's vital, and the reason I was talking about trying to get this motion here, of action in the legs, is there's the squeezing in, okay and there's a lot of effort in the legs if i roll up my uh, pajamas here you can see that the front thighs are going to be super active okay so basically the big difference between kormasana and supta kormasana and this is really vital is the, the the effort it takes to actually straighten the legs in kormasana the effort it takes to be in the pose whereas supta kormasana whether somebody's just taking you in or you're doing it yourself then you'll see suddenly everything here in the muscular it goes much softer it goes jelly like so if i just show you So from here, many of you just need to work on squeezing the inner thighs in. Don't worry if the legs won't straighten. Point and flex. Often it's from here, from the point to the flex, that the heel then slides. And you get yourself a little bit of extra space. You can see how active my front thighs are. Now I relax. Okay? When I relax, to begin with, you bring the feet in this way, you turn the arms, okay? You rest the head either on the floor or on the heels, depending on the, uh, the ratio and the length of the legs and the spine. Many people can quite easily hold the hands together. Many people have to just hold their, uh, their vest at this point, okay? Generally, I don't ask people to cross the feet, okay, like this, too soon, okay? Often, if people cross the feet too soon, if the shoulder hasn't come right through, okay it actually starts to compress here at the top of the chest and the collarbones you'll know it because it feels horrible straight away so that's why often i'll bring the feet here okay and then assess where is the arm in relation to the shoulder for those of you who can what you'll see is you sit up in this position leg is relaxed now in this part it's really vital to learn what to do with the hands so my leg was relaxed as i took it back i now use my left hand forward and i lean forward here okay as I lean forward into this left hand, my weight's on the buttocks, okay? And then I press my head and neck back. So I'm using the strength of my neck and head now to keep my foot in this position, okay? Now this is the important bit. I use only my right hand, okay, to now uh, position this, uh, this leg around. Now if I go back, I'll collide with the foot, so I have to go around the outside. So I'm going way out to the side and then in, okay? I can wiggle the ankles a little bit to cross the feet, okay? I'm on the fingertips, and then from here, I slowly take the chin forward, place the forehead on the floor. From here, if I take the hands wide, I should then be able to um, clasp the hands together. Now from here, I basically relax my legs, okay? The exit is pretty much the same as the exit we did from Bhujapudasana. So for a moment, we take a breath, straightening the legs, Flip back to Bakas in the position and down to uh, Chakwari and so on. So, uh, the main thing I'd 
emphasize in the Kurma to Sukta Kurma is two things. If you've got the mobility and you can work on leg behind head, then like I just showed you, hopefully you've got a few tips there for how to position the hands to stabilize yourself. But the main thing you can work on is thinking of the Kurmasana as incredibly active in the leg, like I showed you here, this active quality. If you can't straighten, you can work on that action here to gain some movement if you get stuck. And then the second pose, the Sukta Kurmasana, is totally passive, if that makes sense to you. So if you were to watch, I'll just demonstrate one more time, if I imitate somebody who's perhaps a little bit stiffer, okay, this is what I'd basically emphasize you try instead. The first part of the pose, very active, Work ankles here, with the breath, slower than I'm doing. Then second part, arms turn, walk in, pacify. If the hands can clasp, that's fine, they often won't, you'll just hold your vest possibly. Okay? But really passive in the legs. It's from that position that I, or whoever's assisting generally in a myself will be able to come and move your legs. But if I'm looking for that motion in the ball and socket joint of the hip here, I want to be able to get that from a position where you've taken all the muscular effort out of the legs. And weirdly enough, they're not weirdly enough, but it's like they'll be soft and loose after you've put the effort in. So there should be a very obvious sense of like effort, oh, and then it's loose. Does that make some sense? So there's this, these two things. If somebody's still making the legs active, and we're trying to then start to move you in, it's impossible. So it's at that point that I just, you know, stop and not start to move people in, okay? So hopefully that's given you a, a, a little bit of insight or, um, yeah, a little bit of useful information and the, uh, uh, this link between Bhujapidasana, Kurmasana and Sukta Kurmasana. And uh, thank you, Stuart, for, uh, for asking me.